Hello and welcome to Insight of Thermology. This is Dr. Amrit welcoming you to another anatomy lecture. Today we are studying the anatomy of conjunctiva. So what is conjunctiva? The term conjunctiva has originated from the word cojoin that basically means to join together. And conjunctiva also joins basically your eye, eyeball and the eyelid together. And therefore the term conjunctiva is given. It is basically a thin translucent mucous membrane. So what you see covering the bulbar conjunctiva or the eyeball and also on the inner side of your eyelid is nothing but it is the conjunctiva. And therefore it is divided into two types. There is a palpable portion which is lining the posterior surface of the eyelid. So if this is your eyelid, the, this is the anterior surface and this is the posterior surface which is closer to the eyeball. So the, eye, the conjunctiva which is lining the posterior surface of the eyelid is called the palpable portion and the conjunctiva which is lining the anterior surface of your eyeball that is called the bulbar portion. And the part of conjunctiva which is actually connecting the two is called the fornicial conjunctiva. Okay, so the palpable conjunctiva, the bulbar conjunctiva and connected by the fornicial conjunctiva. The same thing you can see here. This entire thing is the bulbar conjunctiva and then this picture, in this picture we have actually inverted the lid. So you can see the palpable conjunctiva covering the posterior part of the eyelid and the junction between the two is the fornix. Again, understanding the same thing through this diagram, the green color here is the palpable conjunctiva which is sitting on the posterior aspect of the eyelid. Then we have the bulbar conjunctiva which is covering the sclera or the eyeball up to the limbus. So this is the cornea, this is and this is the sclera. So the junction is called the limbus. Okay, so here what I've marked here is the bulbar conjunctiva and the junction between the two is called the fornix and the conjunctiva which is covering the fornix is called the fornicial conjunctiva. Now the conjunctiva as I told you that it is adhered to the lids. So basically it is firmly adhered to the lids over the tarsal plate whereas if you consider the fornix and the globe it is very loosely adhered to these structures. The exception here is the limbus where the conjunctiva is very strongly adhered. Now let us talk about the parts of conjunctiva in detail. So as I told you the conjunctiva basically has three main parts the palpable conjunctiva, the fornicil conjunctiva and the bulbar conjunctiva. Based on where and what structure it is covering the palpable conjunctiva is further divided. It is divided into marginal conjunctiva, tarsal conjunctiva and the orbital conjunctiva. The conjunctival fornix is not further subdivided. The bulbar conjunctiva is again divided based on the part of the eyeball which, is, which it is covering. So we have a scleral conjunctiva and a limbal conjunctiva. Now let us understand all these one by one. Before we go to that, let us just have a brief overview with this picture. If you can see, this is your eyelid and the eyelid ends are called the margin. So the conjunctiva covering the eyelid margin is called the marginal conjunctiva. Then we have the tarsal plate inside this eyelid. So the conjunctiva which is covering the area of the tarsal plate will be called the tarsal conjunctiva. And then from the tarsal to the fornix, okay, you have a place where the tarsus is not present. So that part is covered by the orbital septum. Now the conjunctiva which covers that part of the orbital septum or the area of the orbital septum is called the orbital conjunctiva which is not marked in this diagram. So that will be your orbital conjunctiva. Then we reach the fornix of the conjunctiva. So the conjunctiva which is covering the fornix is called the fornicial conjunctiva. Then we have finally reached the bulbar conjunctiva. So the part which is covering the sclera is called the scleral conjunctiva. Also we can call it as a bulbar conjunctiva. And ultimately near the cornea we have the limbal zone. So that conjunctiva is called the limbal conjunctiva. So I hope that is clear. Now before we proceed further let us understand an important concept and structure that is the sulcus subtarsalis. Now as the name suggests it is a sulcus or a groove. 
okay and it is present 2 millimeters away from the lid margin so this is the lid margin from where your eyelashes are coming okay and then 2 millimeters from there if you calculate there will be a sulcus or a groove and that sulcus is called a sulcus subtarsalis now why is it important it's important because it is a common site for the foreign body lodgement Another important point regarding sulcus subtarsalis is that that you have a marginal arcade which is nothing but blood vessels which will supply your marginal conjunctiva. So that marginal arcade is actually present in the submuscular plane of the eyelid. Now if you do not understand what is submuscular plane of the eyelid, it is advisable that I have a video on anatomy of eyelid and you go visit that video first before you understand this. So the Marginal arcade is present in that sub uh, submuscular plane and it will actually perforate the uh, perforate this sulcus subtarsalis and reach the marginal conjunctiva and supply the marginal conjunctiva. So therefore the sulcus subtarsalis also becomes a very important landmark for those perforating branches of the marginal arcade. So as I told you, foreign bodies can usually get lost in the sulcus subtarsalis. And another important clinical point is that in trachoma, you will see scarring in the area of sulcus subtarsalis, which can be seen as this white line and it is referred to as the ALS line. Now let us go ahead and understand a little bit more detail about the palpable conjunctival path. So we have a marginal uh, palpable conjunctiva which covers the margin of the eyelid. Then we have sulcus subtarsalis what I explained to you. Then the part of conjunctiva covering the tarsus is the tarsal conjunctiva and then we have the orbital conjunctiva. So first let us see what is this marginal conjunctiva. So if you see in this diagram the first thing that I have marked here is the anterior lid margin okay because it is present anteriorly. Then we have the posterior lid margin. The part between the anterior lid margin and the posterior lid margin will be your intermarginal strip. Okay, so considering your intermarginal strip and to that you add 2 mm above the lid margin that is your sulcus subtarsalis. So if you add on this entire area intermarginal strip plus the distance from the posterior lid margin to the sulcus subtarsalis, the entire thing is your margin uh, is covered basically by the marginal conjunctiva. The area of the marginal conjunctiva is usually considered to be a transitional zone. Now we know that anterior to the anterior lid margin basically it is covered by the skin. So your lid anteriorly is covered by the skin but the inner part is covered by the conjunctiva. So the skin epithelium is totally different from the epithelium of the conjunctiva. In the skin we have the stratified uh, keratinized epithelium whereas the conjunctiva is a non-keratinized epithelium. So the marginal conjunctiva is basically a transitional zone in which the epithelium obviously is stratified. However, the, uh, the, it actually shares the characteristics of both skin as well as the conjunctiva. So that is an important point as to why marginal conjunctiva is a transitional zone between the skin and the conjunctiva. Next we have the tarsal conjunctiva. As I told you, the tarsal conjunctiva is basically covering your tarsus okay both in the superior lid as well as in the inferior lid now this tarsal conjunctiva is highly vascular and it is strongly adhered to the underlying tarsal plate more so in the upper eyelid compared to the lower eyelid now what does the tarsus consist of the tarsus basically consists of the tarsal glands also known as the meibonium glands right so the conjunctiva is very thin and therefore we can actually see this yellowish vertical structures traversing the tarsus muscle through the thin tarsal conjunctiva. The next part of the palpable conjunctiva is the orbital conjunctiva. So if your tarsal plate is present till here and then beyond that what do we have? We have the orbital septum okay till you reach the fornix area. So the conjunctiva which covers that part of uh, where the orbital septum and your Muller's muscle is present in the upper lid and the retractors in the lower lid that is called the orbital conjunctiva okay so we can say it is a part of conjunctiva which is present between the tarsal plate and the fornix okay now this is very loosely present compared to the uh, tarsal conjunctiva okay and when the eyelids move, uh, whenever there's an eye movement this part of the conjunctiva that is the orbital conjunctiva will be thrown into horizontal folds 
It is present over the Muller's muscle as I told you in the upper lid. Finally, we have the fornicial conjunctiva or the conjunctiva which covers the ends that is the fornices. Okay, it is basically also considered to be a junction between the palpebral conjunctiva and the bulbar conjunctiva. That means from the fornis, the bulbar conjunctiva is going to start because now the conjunctiva is going to start covering your eyeball. This fornicial conjunctiva is much more thicker compared to your tarsal conjunctiva and it is much more loosely present to allow for greater movement of the globe. Now, if you actually notice very carefully, there's actually a pocket-like structure or a sac-like structure which is formed because of the conjunctiva between the lids and the eyeball. And that pocket or that sac is actually called the conjunctival sac. So, conjunctiva is forming a sac and that sac, where is it opening? It's actually opening into the palpable fissures. This sac will contain your tear fluid and what is the amount of tear fluid that is present in the sac it is about seven microliters however the capacity is to accommodate up to 30 microliters also so let us understand the dimensions of this conjunctival sac from the lid so if you consider if you just look if you are calculating the distance from the eyelid up to the end of the fornix then that is the dimension that we are going to talk about now. So this conjunctival sac dimension which is measured from the lid you can see is maximum superiorly. So the superior fornixal dimension is the maximum it is about 13 mm. Inferior fornix dimension is about 9 mm. Lateral fornix is 5 mm and the smallest is the medial fornix. Okay the medial fornix is the shallowest and it contains two structures which are plica semilunaris and the carinkle. Coming to the dimensions of the conjunctival sac, if you measure it right from the limbus, it is superiorly 8 to 10 mm, inferiorly also it is 8 to 10 mm, laterally 14 mm, medially it is about 7 mm which is again the least. Now as I told you the medial one is the shallowest and it has two structures that is the carinkle and the plica semilunaris. So what is carinkle first? Carinkle is labeled in this picture. You can see it is actually a fleshy part of the conjunctiva present at the medial canthus and it also sometimes have hair growing on it. So it's also called a hairy part of the conjunctiva. Next we have the plica semilunaris. So the plica semilunaris is actually a crescentic fold of the conjunctiva which is present you know slightly outer to the carinkle and still present at the medial canthus. Ultimately, let us talk about the bulbar conjunctiva. So the part of conjunctiva which is covering the globe, underlying there is a white sclera that is called the bulbar conjunctiva. The bulbar conjunctiva is also loosely present except at a 3 mm zone near the limbus where it is firmly attached, right? Apart from that, wherever your uh, recti muscles are going to get inserted, that part also it is very strongly adhered. So there are two locations where the bulbar conjunctiva is tightly adhered and that is the limbus and the insertion of the rectus muscle. So as you can see we have a part covering the sclera that's a bulbar and then we have the part which is covering the limbus area that's called the limbal conjunctiva. Now another thing is another important clinical point is that at the limbus what happens is that we have this conjunctiva Below the conjunctiva, we have the tenons capsule and then we have the sclera. Now, all these three structures are fused together and they will be very firmly attached at the limbus. And at this region, the conjunctiva will be very much less, the conjunctiva will be actually less mobile. Okay, so this gives you a very firm hold of the globe with the help of forceps at the time of surgery. And therefore, you can actually use uh, this fact to stabilize your globe at the time of surgery by holding the globe using the forceps at the limbus. Let us talk about now the histology of the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva is basically com uh, consisting of three layers. The first one is the epithelium and then we have the substantia propria. The substantia propria has two components, the adenoid layer also called the lymphoid layer and we have the fibrous layer. First, let us talk about the epithelium. The epithelium, as I told you, it is stratified but non-keratinized epithelium. And the part of the conjunctiva which is present near the lids, it has only two layers of epithelium. 
but as you reach the fornix and then from the fornix to the limbus the epithelium is gradually going to become thicker and thicker so i already explained to you regarding the marginal conjunctiva and the trans why marginal conjunctival epithelium is called a transitional zone epithelium now as i told you that the layers of the epithelium in different parts of conjunctiva are actually different so in the marginal conjunctiva you have about five layers of stratified squamous epithelium in tarsal conjunctiva you have only two layers in the fornicil conjunctiva you have about three layers and from the fornix now it's going to start getting to thicken up and then in the bulbar conjunctiva we have 10 layers of the stratified squamous epithelium so you can remember it as 5 plus 2 plus 3 again that becomes 5 and 5 plus 5 is 10. now another important clinical birth now we know that the skin is actually dry and keratinized but the conjunctiva because it has to allow for the movements of the eyeball and moreover because it has to uh, contribute significantly to the tear film secretion actually has non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. But in many disorders of conjunctiva what happens is this moist non-keratinized conjunctiva is converted to a dry keratinized epithelium and this pathologic transition is called squamous metaplasia. For example, this is the normal histology of the conjunctiva in which you are seeing this emptiness and this empty areas are nothing but your goblet cells which are filled up with mucin. But in squamous metaplasia as you can see in this picture there will be this thickening changes thickening of the conjunctiva. And if you do a histology, you can actually see that there's significant amount of keratinization and acanthotic changes in the epithelium of the conjunctiva. Moreover, you do not see any sort of goblet cells also to be present. So this is called squamous metaplasia. So goblet cells are a very important, uh, they form a very important role in the conjunctiva and they are present throughout the epithelium. They arise in the basal layers and they are much more larger as they as you go towards the uh, surface of the epithelium where they are actually going to disintegrate and release their mucin. So the amount of mucin that is produced every day is about 2.2 milliliters and they actually ensure the stability of the tear film by decreasing the surface tension of the tear film. Now after the epithelium we'll go about uh, go and talk about the next layer that is the adenoid layer or the lymphoid layer of the conjunctiva. The adenoid layer or the lymphoid layer basically contains your lymphoid tissue in which you can see follicles. Apart from that you will have mast cells, lymphocyte, plasma cells, neutrophils also present in this layer. Now within this lymphoid uh, tissue you are going to see germinal centers with lymphoblasts. The adenoid layer is actually thickest in the fornicil area, okay, and it terminates at the level of sulcus subtarsalis. So your marginal conjunctiva does not have any sort of adenoid or lymphoid layer. Now another important clinical point here is that the lymphoid layer or the adenoid layer is actually absent in newborns and will only arise after three to four months of age in the fornices. Now, just like we have the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue in the mucosa of the respiratory system, in eye also we have conjunctiva-associated lymphoid tissue, also called the eye-associated lymphoid tissue. It basically will consist of the lymphocytes, lymphatics, plasma cells, which are going to form follicular aggregates and basically contribute to your immunity in the eye. Coming to the last layer, which is the fibrous layer, it, it, it is actually composed of the connected tissue, the fibrous tissue, which is actually going to help you to attach it to the underlying structures. So the fibrous layer attaches firmly to the tarsal plate and it also attaches firmly to the limbus. Okay. Now this attachment is very important. If you were to see papillae in the eye, it is it papillae will actually appear in only those areas of the conjunctiva where the conjunctiva is firmly attached. So you will see papillae at the tarsal plate because conjunctiva is, is attached firmly there and you will also see papillae in the limbal area because the conjunctiva is firmly attached there as well. When we discuss about the anatomy of the conjunctiva, it is also important that we discuss about some of the accessory lacrimal glands 
The reason is that they are situated in the substance of conjunctiva and they secrete their secretions through the conjunctiva. So there are basically three types of accessory lacrimal glands. These are the cross glands, the wolfring gland and the Popov's gland. The first one is the gland of cross. So the cross gland, as you can see, it is actually situated in the loose connective tissue of these conjunctival fornix. So you can also call it as they are basically located in the stroma of the conjunctival fornix and their numbers is quite large. In the upper fornix, they are situated in numbers of about 20 to 40. In the lower fornix, their number is 6 to 8 glands and basically all these will, uh, ducts will unite to form one single duct to open in the fornix. Then we have the glands of Wolfring. The glands of Wolfring are actually situated near the upper border of upper border of the tarsal plate. So this is where the tarsus is actually ending. And you can see that near the upper border of the tarsal plate on the inner side, uh, or we can say uh, near the conjunctiva, they are situated and these are the glands of Wolfring. They are much larger than the cross. However, their numbers are quite smaller. So the numbers are quite few. So the numbers are two to five located along the superior tarsal border. And in the lower eyelid also, you can have similar numbers around two to three. The third type of gland is actually the Popov's gland. So this Popov's gland is actually situated in the substance of the carinca. Now, all these three accessory lacrimal glands, they basically seem to contribute to the basal tear secretion and they have no role in the reflex tear secretion. So that is one important point that you must remember. Apart from that, they basically contribute to 10% of the total lacrimal secretory mass. Now let us talk about one dreaded topic that none of us like and that is the blood supply. So the blood supply of conjunctiva is from, first of all, let us try to enumerate the arteries and then we'll try to make it easier. So we have two arcades. One is present near the margin of the eyelid and one is present in the periphery of the eyelid, right? So obviously the margin one is going to supply the marginal conjunctiva and this marginal conjunctival arcade is called the marginal tarsal arcade or the marginal arcade. Then we have a peripheral arcade which is situated in the periphery of the eyelid and it will supply the part of conjunctiva which is present in the periphery and what is that? That is the fornicial conjunctiva. Apart from that, we have two conjunctival arteries. One is the posterior conjunctival artery okay and one is the anterior conjunctival arteries so both of them together are going to supply the bulbar conjunctiva okay and all these uh, uh, the blood supply and basically these conjunctival arteries mainly they are going to actually form capillary arcades which will extend one millimeter into the cornea as well so what i mean to say is as they're supplying they're also going to enter one millimeter into your cornea Okay, now the marginal arcade and the peripheral arcade, as I told you, they supply basically the marginal ar uh, conjunctiva, the fornicil conjunctiva. So basically the arcades are supplying the palpable conjunctiva, whereas the conjunctival arteries are supplying the bulbar conjunctiva. Now let us understand the formation of the arcade. So here, this is your marginal arcade, which I marked in yellow. And this one is your peripheral tarsal arcade. Now these arcades are basically formed from two palpebral arteries, okay? And then we have the medial palpebral artery, which is coming from the medial aspect of the eyelid. This medial palpebral artery, which is coming from the medial aspect of the eyelid is actually a branch of the dorsal nasal artery, okay? So that is one important thing. Then we have a lateral palpebral artery, which is coming from the lacrimal artery. Okay, now lacrimal artery and dorsal nasal artery, they are basically branches of the ophthalmic artery. So you can remember that lacrimal artery has an L in its name and so does the lateral palpebral artery. So both of them supply the uh, supply laterally. And then we have the dorsal nasal artery and the medial palpebral artery. Now, the lateral palpebral artery and the medial palpebral artery together are going to form this marginal arcade and this peripheral tarsal arcade. So I hope that is clear. 
Now, as you can see in the upper lid, we have two arcades, one marginal and one peripheral. Whereas in the lower lid, we only have one single arcade. Now here I would like to tell you regarding uh, some important anatomical relation of these arcades. So here as you can see we have this marginal arcade and these IO muscles, these are levator and the orbicularis. You can see that in the lid this marginal arcade is present below, this, below these muscles. So the marginal arcade is actually present in your submuscular plane. So that is one important point. Now, to supply the conjunctiva, it needs to perforate this tarsus at one location and then come to the conjunctiva and supply the palpable conjunctiva. So, that location where it perforates is actually your sulcus subtarsalis. Okay. After it perforates sulcus subtarsalis, the marginal arcade is going to divide into two branches. One branch is going to go up and one is going to come downwards. The one which is going up is called the ascending branch. And the one which is going down is called the descending branch of the marginal arcade. Similarly, we have the peripheral tarsal arcade which is located here. Okay, so this peripheral tarsal arcade is again going to come to conjunctiva but this time it is not going to pierce the tarsus. It is going to pierce a muscle which is attached to tarsus and that is the Muller's muscle. After it pierces or perforates this Muller's muscle, it is again dividing into a descending branch and an ascending branch. Now, the descending branch of the peripheral tarsal arcade is going to anastomose with the ascending branch of the marginal arcade and together they are going to supply this entire palpable conjunctive. Now the ascending branch of the peripheral arcade is going to travel towards the fornix and reach the bulbar conjunctiva. Now this ascending branch of the peripheral tarsal arcade as it travels across the fornix and reaches the bulbar conjunctiva, this artery is called the posterior conjunctival artery. So this was the concept that I wanted to explain to you about the posterior conjunctival artery. So this will be more clear in this diagram. You can see marginal arcades, you can see peripheral arcades and you can see the ascending branch of the peripheral arcade traveling the fornix forming the posterior conjunctival artery. Apart from that, we have another arteries, okay, or another set of arteries which are coming along the muscles and these are called the anterior ciliary artery. So these anterior ciliary arteries are basically branches of the muscular artery and they usually come along the muscles, okay. So for every muscle, we have two anterior ciliary arteries except the lateral rectus which has only one anterior ciliary artery. So in my video on anatomy of the extraocular muscles, I have explained to you in detail regarding the blood supply of the muscles. And in, in that video, I actually explained to you about this anterior ciliary artery. So now you can see that the bulbar conjunctiva is actually supplied by this posterior conjunctival artery and the anterior ciliary artery. Coming to the venous supply. So if you talk about the venous supply, the conjunctival veins are more in number compared to the conjunctival arteries and most of the veins will drain into the superior and the inferior ophthalmic vein from the eyelid plexus. However, the part of, of the limbus, that means the limbal area, is basically draining into the anterior ciliary vein. Coming to the lymphatic supply, so to understand the lymphatic supply of the conjunctiva, you will actually divide the eyeball into two parts, two halves. So the medial part uh, will basically be draining into the submandibular group of lymph nodes. So if this is your nose, this part is the medial part. This medial part of conjunctiva will drain into the submandibular group of lymph nodes, whereas the lateral part will drain into the preauricular group of lymph nodes. What about the nerve supply of the conjunctiva? The conjunctival nerve supply comes basically from the ophthalmic division on the branches of the maxillary division of the fifth cranial nerve. So can you enumerate some of the functions of conjunctiva? Okay, so first one is tear production as I told you that it is basically helping by producing mucin. Okay, and mucin is an important component of the tear film that is coming from the goblet cells. And the aqueous component of the tear film is contributed by the accessory lacrimal gland. So this is how conjunctiva helps in tear production. 
it helps in supply of oxygen directly to the cornea okay when the eyes are open the oxygen from the envi environment will actually diffuse into the tear film and through the conjunctiva it is going to reach the cornea it helps in washing off the debris uh, via the function of tears it maintains a smooth ocular surface and definitely because we have so many lymphocytes present we have the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue okay and we have so many provisions for immunological mechanisms in the eye through the conjunctiva and therefore conjunctiva basically helps to protect the eye by various immunological defense mechanisms what about some of the non pathogenic organisms which are living in the conjunctiva so these are called the commensals so these are the staphylococcus albus the staphylococcus epidermidis diphtheroids propinobacterium acne neisseria catarrhalis and coronibacterium xerosus so here the species is very important okay so these are the common commensals present in the conjunctival sac so that's all for the anatomy and some physiology of the conjunctiva thank you and have a nice day